Okay, let's start. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. Hola, hello, bonjour, hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, annyeonghaseyo, and hello all. Welcome and thank you, Simbis people, for joining us the 135th seminar, and I call it a Technion Day. I am in Sweden after giving two invited talks at the ARDD Aging Conference and DTU Denmark. I came here to give an invited talk at Chalmers University of Technology tomorrow and spend the weekend in Stockholm, where of course, as you know, the Nobel Prize ceremony is held every year. Okay, it is my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Professor Avi Schroeder. He is a professor at Technion Israel Institute of Technology, which I visited in 2022. He is also the president of the Controlled Release Society. He and I also overlapped our postdoctoral training period at MIT, where he finished his training at the uh, Bob Langer lab, probably the most famous engineer in history. Uh, he's the founder of many, many, many companies, uh, uh, including the Moderna. And I believe the Professor Avi Schroeder also very interesting translational technology de development and then pioneer in the uh, drug delivery and some other field. So this is my great honor to have him and then super delighted to have him finally. So Avi, thank you so much for your scientific contribution and the huge service to the community as the president of the Control Release Society, I know how much you know, responsibility and the thing you need to do as a president. So I'm really thank you for your service. And then virtual podium is all yours now. And thank you again. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Tay. It's really great being here uh, together with uh, you and with Brian and uh, and uh, all the participants of the, uh, the call tonight. And, uh, I know you're going to also be placing this uh, uh, lecture online, so also for people who will be joining us uh, later on. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and, and I just return it back to you. Thank you for your pioneering work, both scientifically, but also in supporting, I think, science and the growth of science by raising fundamental issues that haven't been touched in the past. Uh, these are a, a aspect that people that are not aware, I, I strongly recommend following Tay's, uh, Tay's work. And, and Brian, it's really fantastic uh, uh, giving, uh, just warming up the, the seat for you so you can actually give your, your main talk. So I'll really be very, very brief in my, in my talk, only uh, a couple minutes and, and really just to, uh, um, to, uh, to discuss one area that we've been working on uh, over the past, uh, past couple of years. And uh, uh, this is actually uh, integrating of synthetic cells uh, into the drug delivery world. And, and, and more specifically, it's really, it's taking the world of, uh, of synthetic biology and bring it into the world of drug delivery. Because we, we did feel at a certain stall when we look at the drug delivery systems. And, and the way I used to think about it is that if in the past we used to take a truck a, or, a, or a spaceship and, and it has already the astronaut inside, that would be our drug delivery system and target a specific region inside the body, we asked today if we can actually take a whole factory and bring it into the body instead of having already a payload that's already uh, pre uh, preset. And for, for that, we need uh, several synthetic biology tools, uh, but we do believe it, it holds great promise for uh, uh, for uh, for drug delivery. And the way we imagine these systems is that from the outside, the body uh, they would be camouflaged from the immune system. Uh, but from the inside, they would actually have all the molecular machines that are necessary for producing therapeutic agents such as proteins or RNA inside the body, wherever they're actually necessary. So a full machine that can be turned on from the outside that would actually, uh, that would actually produce the medicine 
that a specific patient would need and also would, like every factory, churn it out. And, and the advantage is that a factory you can turn on, you can turn off, uh, you can place, position different re uh, regions, and it can also produce different, diff uh, different types of, of medicines over, over time. And uh, uh, what do we have inside these synthetic cells? We actually have all those molecular machines that are necessary for decoding DNA and producing a protein, uh, a protein of interest. In addition, uh, we also have the switch for, for turning on these systems from the outside. And just due to the interest of time today, I won't be able to, to show all the, all the features of synthetic cells, but they actually are pretty, pretty wide. And this is a, a, an evolving area inside a, uh, the world of drug delivery and SynBio. Uh, but just to give a small feel of these systems, this is a study that a former PhD student in our group uh, carried out, Nitsan Krinsky, and she actually captured one of the synthetic cells as it was synthesizing um, a protein, green fluorescent protein, actually. And you can see the, the synthetic cell, it's this dark uh, region, uh, uh, this, uh, this vesicle. And when you turn on the synthetic cell, and actually starts synthesizing GFP. And you can notice the green color inside the synthetic cell. This is a super folder GFP. So it actually folds very, very rapidly, but you can notice how much protein is actually uh, being produced inside, uh, inside these systems. Uh, this is of course a reporter uh, protein, but you could also uh, manufacture uh, therapeutic proteins. And, and that is something that we actually went on uh, to do over, over the years. Uh, but Still, if we compare, for example, synthetic cells to natural cells, natural cells are more efficient when we manufacture. We're capable of getting uh, 60, 70, sometimes 80% of the synthetic cells to manufacture the drug of interest. However, still, we don't have 100% or close to 100% as we have in natural cells. But we are capable of producing a wider array of proteins or of a specific RNA uh, uh, molecules that were that were uh, that are of interest. So I would say the two uh, uh, technologies, if we look at uh, uh, the traditional drug delivery systems versus uh, cell-based therapies, the synthetic cells are somewhere in the in the middle, allowing some of both and possibly certain areas that you you can even be better uh, than than each one of those uh, specific technologies. Um, so what, what could we actually use them for? We could produce different, uh, uh, different reporter proteins or produce therapeutic proteins. This is a study we carried out together with the Tel Aviv University. And uh, uh, there we actually looked at manufacturing Pseudomonas exotoxin A. This is a, a toxic protein and uh, enough of one or one to 10 copies of this protein to actually kill a cancer cell. So you can notice in culture, these are triple negative breast cancer cells. And in green are the synthetic cells that are churning out this Pseudomonas exotoxin A. And you can notice the kill zone around each one of these synthetic cells. Actually, the cancer cells are, are, a, are a, a, a eradicated by the, uh, by the treatment. But, but uh, another PhD student in our group, she actually, uh, Galchen, asked not only to treat cancer, she asked if we could use synthetic cells also for promoting angiogenesis. Could we actually run tissue regeneration using synthetic cells? And what she did is instead of encoding for a toxic protein, she encoded for FGF, which is a VEGF-like protein, a protein that actually encodes the body to start forming blood vessels. And what she did is she took a human a, a endothelial cells and she added the synthetic cells to the culture the green dots you can see here are not the synthetic cells. These are the, uh, these huvic uh, endothelial cells. And when she added the synthetic cells, these huvic cells actually started self-organizing into tubules, into minuscule blood vessels uh, based on the coding of the synthetic cells. So the synthetic cells can actually talk to natural cells and encode processes. If you take these synthetic cells and you embed them inside a, uh, a tissue, you can actually start regenerating blood vessels inside the tissue itself with collagen being built around the blood vessels. And, uh, uh, and you get a full structure of blood vessels and tissues that would not encode for it without the, uh, without the synthetic cell. Each one of these colors is actually a different uh, aspect or a different component of blood vessels and their structure after adding the synthetic cells. But to convince us that we can actually 
uh, use these systems inside the body, what we did is we implanted them inside a, uh, inside a polymeric scaffold. Then we implanted the polymeric scaffold that contained the synthetic cells inside the body, and they started sending out signals to the body to uh, grow blood vessels into the polymeric matrix. And you can notice here, this is, uh, this is one of these polymeric matrices after being taken out of the body. And you can notice the blood vessels that were naturally actually built by the body inside the polymeric matrix due to the code that was, or the signal that was sent out by the synthetic uh, cell. So um, when we compare this, of course, to the control, we get, uh, we get a, a far better uh, uh, production of blood vessels, hardly any produced uh, in the controls. And again, we see that synthetic cells can actually interact with natural uh, uh, tissue. So just to wrap it all up, um, what is interesting in my eyes about synthetic cells is that you can really play with them a lot. A synthetic cell is a system that can be large, it can be small. We've gone down to the nanoscale and we've gone up to the micron scale. You can encode for many different uh, uh, proteins and you can actually play with this system in order to manufacture whatever almost you want inside the body. So you're not limited by the, uh, the limits that, uh, that nature gives us. Still nature is amazing. Um, but with that, I would like to end and really pass my uh, talk on to uh, to, to Brian, uh, who takes, I think, synthetic biology another step forward, really with amazing, amazing work. So um, I'll end here, Tay, with uh, thanking you, thanking Brian, thanking our audience today. Uh, really excited being here and uh, listening to Brian in his next uh, talk. Uh, have a great evening. Shalom from Israel. Thank you so much. It's an amazing talk. Uh, I believe, you know, the those synthetic cell, you know, has huge potential of uh, both fundamental understanding of living system and also uh, application in the future. So I really appreciate it, you know, your leadership in this field at the same time, you know, your contribution again to the society by uh, as a chair of uh, the president of the society. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure being here. Thank you so much for including me in your program. Thank you. All right. So now the main speaker of today with a longer introduction. Dr. Brian Huang completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, where he was introduced to synthetic biology in the lab of Jerome Fox. He then pursued his PhD at Georgia Tech, where he worked in the lab of Corey Wilson. There he focused on the development of cellular uh, programming strategies to an engineer next, gen next generation live microbial therapeutics. He is currently in the lab of Seth Lakoff uh, Nahum's lab at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, where he is expanding and applying his synthetic biology skill set to microbiome research. Geographically and intellectually, he has been pursuing a variety of areas and field, making him a true rising star. Brian, thank you so much for your time today, and please take it away, all yours now. Thank you. All right, is my screen sharing? Yes, looks good. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Taysok, for that nice introduction. It's really such a, a pleasure to be part of this amazing series. And thank you, Avi, for sharing some of your amazing work. Um, so today I will be talking about some of my PhD work uh, done at Georgia Tech, where we really focused on developing new strategies to, to design genetic circuits uh, for the application of engineering microbes as living therapeutics. So for those who might not be as familiar with the field of synthetic biology, uh, one of the primary focuses of scientists in this area is to develop strategies to program cells with gene circuits 
so that we can encode novel functions into these organisms. So here we're depicting some generic bacterial cell. And what we can do is equip the cell with sensors or regulators of gene expression. And these sensors respond to different chemicals or temperature or even wavelengths of light, for instance. Now these regulators are controlling intricate networks of gene expression in the form of genetic circuits inside of the cell. And then the outputs of these circuits can be a variety of actuators. These might be fluorescent proteins to measure the performance of the circuit or communication uh, genes to actually send chemicals to other cells or even RNAs, for instance. So these engineered bacteria are being applied in many areas of the life sciences today. And this talk will focus on their applications as living therapeutics. And here you can see an envisioned bacterium that's been engineered to sense inflammation in the human gut and then respond by producing some anti-inflammatory at the site of disease. There's some other interesting applications as well, including for drug manufacturing. So here we can actually use metabolic engineering to rewire the metabolism of a microbe to actually produce pharmaceutical chemicals or drugs. We can apply them in agriculture. Where we can use nitrogen fixing microbes that associate uh, with plant roots to replace uh, our reliance on uh, synthetic fertilizers. We've even seen recent efforts for environmental remediation where people have engineered bacteria uh, to essentially detoxify and clean up our environment. This begs the question of how do we actually engineer these so-called intelligent microbes? So first, we need the ability to encode advanced decision-making or biosensing capabilities into our bacteria. Now, two leading strategies to achieve this are transcriptional programming, which will be the focus of my talk. And this is a technique that was developed in the Wilson lab at Georgia Tech. And then the second leading approach is the cello circuit design platform from the Voigt lab at MIT. So we also need to be able to communicate between cells to program a community behavior. This is typically done by repurposing small molecule synthase genes so that we can have one bacterium send a chemical message that a second bacterium can respond to. Then finally, we need the ability to encode memory for long-term applications. The leading strategies to achieve this are using CRISPR-Cas base editing systems and recombinase-mediated DNA rearrangements so we can store uh, heritable changes in the DNA. So this work from my thesis had three primary motivations. Now, the first was that we were lacking strategies to program behavior of medically relevant non-model bacteria. The second is that traditional genetic circuit design uh, strategies are metabolically burdensome on the cell and relatively inefficient. And this results in their instability over time. And then finally, the major challenge is that the predictive design of genetic circuits has proven to be notoriously difficult due to the non-modularity of all the interacting molecular components. So I'll share two different projects that I worked on uh, at Georgia Tech, the first being our efforts to uh, transfer our transcriptional programming technology into the Bacteroides genus. And then I'll discuss our latest work where we actually developed a predictive design strategy uh, for creating transcriptional programmings uh, in E. coli. The primary objective of this first project was to take our uh, transcriptional programming technology, and this is our genetic circuit technology, that we developed in E. coli and transfer this to the medically relevant Bacteroides genus. Now we're interested in the Bacteroides because these are anaerobic prokaryotes that are naturally commensal in the human gastrointestinal tract. And this uh, specific genus comprises up to 25% of our microbiota, which makes them really attractive candidates to engineer as potential living therapeutics. So just as a brief introduction to transcriptional programming, uh, this technology relies on these synthetic modular transcription factors that we engineer in the lab. These are all based on the lacai galar scaffold, and they're composed of a ligand binding domain that responds to a particular uh, small molecule ligand that we represent with a colored hexagon. And then there's a modular DNA binding domain that corresponds to a short DNA operator sequence that we typically associate with a promoter. So we have a large set of these ligand binding domains that recognize different small molecule inputs, and these are mostly uh, common sugars um, often found in the diet. 
And then we've engineered a variety of different uh, DNA binding domains that are largely orthogonal to one another, each recognizing their corresponding color-coded uh, uh, DNA operator sequence shown here. Now, a key feature of these uh, transcription factors is that we have two different phenotypes. The first is the classic repressor, which serves as an off to on switch of gene expression because it releases its hold of DNA only in the presence of its ligand. But what our lab has done is engineered this inverted phenotype that we call the anti-repressor. So this is functionally opposite where it only binds to DNA in the presence of its ligand, serving as a single input not gate or an on to off switch. So what we can do is develop uh, these rational genetic architectures where we direct networks of transcription factors to different promoters to regulate gene expression in a higher order manner. So if you imagine uh, this example, we're taking two different repressors that respond to different inputs, regulating the same promoter. We can abstract this as a logical AND operation with a binary truth table shown here. And we call this an AND gate because gene expression is only achieved if ligand one and ligand two are present in the system. So at the outset of this project, we needed to identify high-performing transcription factors from our E. coli studies, uh, because we knew working in the Bacteroides that we would be limited to relatively low expression levels due to the need for single copy uh, genomic integration of our circuits. So we selected the IPTG responsive and D ribose responsive transcription factors. Those are the LACI and RBSR transcription factors respectively, and their corresponding antiropressors that we've engineered previously. So we adapted uh, the expression and uh, promoter architectures of these transcription factors for Bacteroides, because these, uh, these species differ significantly from typical prokaryotes, uh, such as E. coli. And what we're showing here is the dynamic range of five different promoters regulated by uh, each transcription factor. And the regulation is of a uh, nanoluc lucif brace reporter gene. So each square is the dynamic range or the ratio of the on to off states of gene expression uh, for each different promoter. And our goal was to have tight control of gene expression with a high dynamic range of greater than 20, which we were able to achieve uh, through optimization of these promoter architectures. So this was originally characterized uh, in the most well-known bacteroidae species, uh, B theta iota omicron, or BT for short. We wanted to see if we could transfer these uh, simple gene circuits to other human donor bacteroides, specifically B. fragilis, vulgatus, ovatus, and uniformis. And essentially, we copy and pasted our designs from B. theta into these four additional bacteroides. As you can see across the board, uh, the performance is largely holed up with slight variations between species, between different transcription factors. But essentially, now we have a very large set of single input, single output gene circuits we can control heterologous gene expression in five different bacteroidae species. So now our goal was to systematically develop all 16 two input single output gene circuits uh, so that we can have a functionally complete programming language in these bacteria. So what we can do is systematically vary uh, the phenotypes of transcription factors that we direct to a single promoter to create these simple single promoter logic gates, the AND, NOR, and the imply operations. However, if we want to create more additional advanced circuits, we actually need to layer uh, these circuits by using one transcription factor to regulate a second transcription factor, which then in turn can regulate our output. But again, we can do this in a systematic manner where we change the phenotypes of these transcription factors in each position, and we achieve additional circuits, including the NAND, OR, and two imply operations. So we benchmarked all of these circuits originally in Bacteroides theta iota omicron. We confirmed that all of these function well in our additional four Bacteroides species. And here we're showing the most complex circuits that we created, the XNOR and XOR, showing high digital performance uh, across the genus. So now we wanted to move beyond regulation of this uh, nanoloop gene, which in principle can be a proxy for any heterologous gene of interest. And we wanted to gain control over host genes as well. And to do this, we turned to the classic CRISPR interference technique. Uh, but first, we needed to verify that our transcriptional circuits uh, can control guide RNA expression in a robust fashion. So here we're testing the knockdown of 
uh, a nano loop gene using a constitutively expressed uh, DCAS9, and then a regulated guide RNA uh, using a single transcription factor. And we confirmed that we can achieve 50 to 100 fold knockdown of this reporter gene in all five of our bacteroides, showing that we have robust control of guide RNA uh, regulation. So as an application of uh, this CRISPR interference technology, uh, we decided to apply it to the control of polysaccharide uh, utilization and the bacteroides. So here, what we're showing is uh, a repurposed AND gate regulating guide RNA expression. And this guide is targeting an endogenous gene, which is implicated in the metabolism of inulin, which is a common carbohydrate found in the Western diet. And we're deploying this circuit uh, specifically in the Buniformis species. So as you can see from this uh, set of growth curves, uh, our phenotype is exactly how we would expect. We're only in the presence of both ligands where we actually express our guide RNA. We see a significant fitness deficit in this species, really showing that we can essentially digitally control the uh, fitness of this species using our synthetic circuits. So why would we, we why would we be interested in uh, regulating these uh, polysaccharide utilization genes? Uh, it turns out these bacteroides exist in these very intricate networks of utilization, uh, production, and inhibition of one another based on their ability to degrade different polysaccharides. So we uh, we have a theory that if we can modulate uh, the fitness of individual strains in a community, then we can actually control uh, the community composition. So here is our abstraction of the Buniformis strain from uh, the previous slide showing the AND gate behavior. So what we did was we engineered a complementary species, uh, B. ovatus, to have an OR gate to regulate a guide RNA uh, targeting the analogous genes and in inulin metabolism. And what we wanted to do was co-culture these species uh, in vitro and see if we can dynamically regulate the composition of our community using our synthetic circuits. What we would expect to see is in the absence of ligand, both species retain their fitness. And then in the presence of a single ligand, either IPDG or ribose, we should only knock down our blue species, the Obatis. But if both ligands are present, we would expect to see a diminished uh, abundance of both species uh, in the culture. So we perform this uh, co-culture competition experiment. And at the end, our uh, our time frame, 16 hours, we can see for our AND gate strain, just as expected, we see only a fitness loss with both ligands. And for our blue strain with the OR gate, as expected again, in the presence of we see significant fitness deficit, showing that we can achieve a dynamic regulation of our community in this uh, synthetic uh, co-culture system. So just as a quick summary of this first part, uh, we began by uh, adapting and exhaustively characterizing our transcriptional programming technology in five bacteroides species relevant to the human gut. We then expanded this system to gain control over host genes by coupling our transcriptional programs with CRISPR interference. Then finally, we applied this to regulate uh, polysaccharide utilization in multiple bacteroides uh, to demonstrate multiplexed regulation and community control. So for part two, uh, we shifted our efforts back to essential, uh, essentially fundamental design of uh, transcription programs to see if we can develop a more accurate predictive strategy uh, to design these programs uh, in the model organism E. coli. And the objective here, uh, as I showed in the previous section, was uh, this transcriptional programming can be essentially done in a qualitative fashion based on intuition, where we can uh, tune these circuits manually to achieve digital performance. But uh, the second leading technology for gene circuit design, cello programming, is able to use logic synthesis to uh, qualitatively design its circuits. And this is based on the fact that uh, cello uses layered knot and nor gates uh, to create all of their circuits. And as I mentioned, we're currently lacking a quantitative prediction method for transcriptional programming. And uh, Cello does have a quantitative uh, predictive capacity, but as you can see in this chart, uh, they're lacking some accuracy. And this is really due to limitations in the circuit design due to the extremely high complexity of Cello circuits. 
And what we see with transcriptional programs is we actually have a reduction in complexity due to our ability to use the anti-repressor phenotype and networking uh, regulation of a single promoter by multiple transcription factors. So we asked ourselves, can we actually predict circuit behaviors more accurately if we're using our transcriptional programming platform compared to cello programming? So for this particular project, we constrained our design space to a three input system based on three different orthogonal ligands, IPTG, ribose, and cellobios, which interact with uh, these pairs of repressor, anti-repressor, respectively. And we selected five DNA binding domains, each recognizing uh, a synthetic promoter that we engineered. However, our first challenge was that this cellobios anti-repressor currently does not exist. So to complete this set of transcription factors, we actually need to engineer this. So we can turn to a workflow that we have developed in our lab, where we start with our, uh, our typical repressor phenotype shown here, showing strong uh, regulation, uh, strong dynamic range and tight regulation of a GFP reporter gene. And we can actually disrupt the allosteric communication in the protein here at the dimerization interface uh, to create what we call a super repressor variant. And the super repressor retains DNA binding uh, function, so it uh, permanently retains uh, the gene in the off state, but is insensitive to the ligand. So then we can perform directed evolution and a high throughput screening to evolve this desired anti repressor phenotype. And here, this resulted from uh, an alteration in the C terminus of the protein. As you can see, we've flipped the phenotype so that gene regulation goes from on to off in the presence of the ligand. So now we've achieved our first goal and we've completed our set of uh, three uh, repressor anti repressor pairs, each with an orthogonal uh, input signal. So now we had to address this major challenge in gene circuit design where genetic context affects uh, parts behavior uh, in a given expression cassette. So here is a typical uh, expression cassette a schematic that many would be familiar with. We have some promoter. Uh, a ribozyme to insulate and normalize our mRNA transcript, the ribosome binding site, or RBS, and then some gene of interest. And the five prime uh, region of this gene of interest is highlighted uh, because it's particularly important in regulating translation initiation. So what we and others have noticed is that the specific composition of different promoters, ribozymes, RBSs, and genes can result in many problems, including cryptic promoter generation, which may uh, attenuate uh, transcription, for instance, of the desired promoter, or alternative transcription or translation start sites, and even uh, this uh, concept of uh, misfolding of the RBS based on the 5' prime UTR interacting with it, essentially reducing our expected gene expression. And we can illustrate how this context is a significant problem uh, by comparing the expression of a uh, GFP reporter gene uh, using a common te technique known as the relative promoter unit. Um, we're expressing this gene from five synthetic promoters that we've developed, uh, each with a different ribozyme uh, to insulate and provide sequence diversity. And even though these promoters are based on the same uh, core architecture and these ribozymes are functionally equivalent, we see a, qu a quantitative difference in the gene expression from all five. Now, strikingly, if we just change the five prime of our gene of interest to include a short section of the LACI transcription factor, we now see both a qualitative and quantitative change in the expression from all five of these promoters. This really highlights the issue of using the relative promoter unit as a proxy for gene expression, because when you actually change your GFP gene uh, to your true gene of interest, you may alter the expression levels. We also confirmed that RBS strengths are not modular when they're swapped between promoters, when all other uh, factors are conserved. And here we developed uh, a graded RBS library for our gray promoter and then applied it to our green promoter. And again, the qualitative and quantitative trends don't track. And then finally, the simple uh, swapping of a ribozyme itself, uh, all having different uh, sequences, uh, but functional equivalency has quantitative effects on the gene expression patterns when we fix the promoter and all other elements. So taken together, 
uh, we're proposing to replace the RPU style of measuring gene expression with what we're calling a context-specific expression cassette. And essentially what this requires is that one fixes the identity of the promoter, their ribozyme, if they choose to use it, the RBS, and then the five prime uh, gene of interest. And they can still use a GFP gene as a proxy for uh, expression via fluorescence, but all of these factors must be considered at once to gain an accurate measurement of their intended target gene. So to test our theory and how accurate this context-specific expression cassette is, uh, we applied this system to the uh, prediction of fundamental single input transcriptional programs. So here we developed this transcription factor titration circuit where we can use uh, a LUXR regulated promoter to titrate in the amount of a given transcription factor. And then we include the cognate promoter and reporter gene for that transcription factor to regulate. So you can see on this plot uh, going from left to right, as we increase the concentration of our transcription factor in the system, we follow the black curve and we're shutting off our output as expected. And then we repeat this uh, same process in the presence of our ligand. This is uh, in this case, ribose. And we see uh, that this circuit is essentially behaving as expected and uh, retaining high expression uh, for most of expression levels of the transcription factor. But as we increase uh, expression of our TF too high, we see that we actually lose uh, some of our output, showing that there's essentially a sweet spot of expression uh, where there's an optimal performance or essentially dynamic range that we can calculate based on the difference between these curves. So now we can actually develop a targeted RBS library for the promoter of interest that we know we'll express this transcription factor from uh, for future circuits. So here we did this for uh, our, our uh, promoter of interest on a different uh, vector system that will express our cons will constitutively express our transcription factors from. Uh, we have a nice graded uh, uh, set of RBSs shown here. And what we can do is select the RBS that corresponds to our uh, optimal expression level. We can assign that RBS uh, to express our transcription factor from. And then we can create uh, a simple uh, single input, single output circuit shown here. So we performed this workflow for all 30 of our transcription factors, and we compared the predicted expression levels, which are the red lines, to the actual measured data, uh, the gray and green bars, respectively. And we see across the board very high uh, high quality agreement between our predicted model and our experimental data. And the average error uh, across this set of 60 states is less than 1.5 fold or 50%, which is a significant improvement over uh, previous circuit technologies. And what's really interesting to us is that the, the primary source of our error is actually in the off state of gene expression, tending to be lower than we predicted which actually indicates that our circuits are behaving better than expected. So now we wanted to extend this workflow beyond single input circuits uh, to predictively design two input circuits. And here we're showing our workflow for this. So if a user is interested in developing uh, here, a uh, this is an imply gate, we would first define our truth table. And then using transcriptional programming rules that we have now uh, codified uh, in collaboration uh, with some other groups at Georgia Tech, we can essentially generate this generic circuit topology where we fix the phenotype of our transcription factors and the regulation patterns, but we leave open the identities of uh, different promoters and DNA binding domains so that we have many options uh, to simulate. So we can go actually simulate the performances uh, in silico of different circuits uh, that would behave in the same fashion and then we can identify the most optimal design to assign our specific parts. So finally, we'll construct and test our circuit. And here is the actual data from uh, this workflow applied to this imply gate. And we see almost perfect agreement uh, between our prediction uh, and our experimental data. So really just to test the limits and show that we can apply this to three input systems, uh, we essentially mine the literature for the most difficult circuit that's been constructed to date, which turns out to be the three input XNOR or consensus circuit. And this corresponds to an output state 
only being on in the absence of all ligands or in the presence of all ligands. So using our new workflow for predictive design, uh, we generate this circuit topology, which requires six transcription factors and four regulated promoters to achieve our desired phenotype. Uh, and as uh, when we test this circuit, we see again, according uh, in accordance with our previous uh, demonstrations, our error is less than 50% on average, and we are recapitulating the phenotype that we're desiring, which is uh, only high in the lack of ligands or presence of all ligands. So now it's important to compare our advancement to uh, the previous state of the art, which is the cello technology. And this design was reported uh, in their first publication many years ago, uh, which required 10 transcription factors and 13 regulated promoters to achieve the same circuit. And as we can see, uh, when we compare the states, uh, the error is on the order of a thousand percent here. Um, and we chalk this up to this massive complexity of the circuit and the requirement for predicting so many different interactions. So as a brief summary of this second part, uh, we began by really dissecting and considering how does genetic context uh, affect different circuit behaviors and uh, developing this context-specific expression cassette to more accurately model gene expression. And we applied this uh, to the development of fundamental transcriptional programs with high accuracy. We extended this workflow to two and three input circuits and confirmed that our workflow uh, is applicable to these more complicated designs and retains its accuracy, really highlighting the power uh, of this context-specific expression cassette. We also applied this uh, to some metabolic engineering where we actually used our uh, informed design uh, to regulate the expression of multiple enzymes for lycopene expression. And I can talk about that a little more uh, in the supplement if we have time. Uh, but with that, I'll wrap it up and thank everyone who helped on these projects, uh, specifically uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Tom Grossclose, who worked on uh, the first project with me, uh, and then my colleagues, uh, uh, Dewan Kim and Young Jun, who've helped on uh, many projects. And Young Jun has uh, done extraordinary work on uh, the second project with me in collaboration with multiple labs at Georgia Tech. Yeah, so with that, I'll wrap it up and uh, happy to take any questions. Fantastic talk. Thank you. Uh, let me start a question uh because you mentioned before the session start you wanted to implement your genetic circuit uh, expertise to microbiome so could you kind of elaborate that part it's future work but it, it might be very important for your career and to the community yeah yeah i think um my PhD work was largely application driven. And I think my uh, my interest is now in sort of inverting that, uh, my interest into actually uh, more, maybe the discovery of mechanisms of different diseases. And we're specifically focusing on some food allergy and immunology uh, here um, in Seth's lab. And I think eventually I'll hopefully be able to apply my skill set. Uh, to sort of use our findings and maybe develop some strategies uh, to prevent these diseases, maybe from engineered bacterial uh, standpoints. Good. Uh, my second question is, you know, you probably, you already touched a little bit, but I want to hear more extensive or extended kind of answer for that one. So as you know, the genetic circuit or synthetic bodies started year 2000 with the toggle switch and the refrigerator or another circuit if I add that is basically uh, a feedback negative feedback circuit and then now we are talking about 24 years of circuit design and mm -hmm. uh, building and then gigantic you know work done by cello and Chris Boy and now we still have some challenges to make this circuit design and construction moving forward. What do you think that kind of challenge we currently have and how can we overcome? 
Yes, I, I think there are so many, many challenges that can be, some can be overcome and some may still prove to be difficult. I think the primary one, which was the focus of my second half, was really the issue of uh, predicting gene expression uh, has, has simply just not been addressed until now. Um, this is so widely used, this RPU metric, um, which we've really demonstrated should be replaced with a with a more sensitive metric, because when we're expressing these intricate networks of transcription factors, we really need to be precise within, you know, maybe 1.5 to twofold of their expression level. And if you're tenfold off, then your whole circuit might break. Um, so I think addressing that issue of predictability is critical. And then the second factor uh, that I, I didn't touch on as much is that uh, we really need to develop uh, essentially simpler designs because you know, the cell has a limited uh, resource pool for uh, transcription and translation. Uh, most cells don't like to express 20 heterologous genes. Uh, so if we can achieve the same functions uh, with fewer genes, fewer promoters, fewer resources, uh, that should uh, both increase our ability to more accurately predict uh, these circuits, but also uh, should limit our uh, our burden on the cells uh, and essentially make them uh, happier and less likely to uh, evolve and, and break our circuits. Uh, so I think those are two of the primary challenges that we've we've sought to address, but I, I believe they could still be improved further. Sure. I see some questions from audience. Uh, the first question from Kenyon Alexander, uh, he asked, what is the advantage of microorganisms incorporating genetic circuit rather than microorganisms genetically engineered to have a desired activity? Uh, that's a little bit interesting. Uh, and that, so can you answer that question? And then he has another question. Are there any good examples mm -hmm. of one being better than the other? I think if I understand correctly, the question is sort of what is the utility of the circuits mm -hmm. instead of why not just engineer a specific function. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the circuits and the, the general transcriptional programming can be viewed as a tool to engineer. Uh, one, it could be to engineer a specific function where we can very precisely regulate expression of some gene, either some heterologous or endogenous gene. Um, and two, it, the circuits allow us to, uh, maybe one example could be to control multiple genes in the, in the same organism uh, with different inputs, different inducers, or as I demonstrated with the co-culture experiment, we can uh, put these circuits into different bacteria and regulate them at the same time with a common set of inputs. Um, so uh, I think the applications really are endless. Uh, it just depends on uh, what the specific uh, uh, goal is for engineering the bacterium. Uh, but this, this, the circuit design is really more of a tool that can then be applied. Yeah, that, that's a good answer. But to add one more thing, uh, basically the, the question, uh, to me, I mean, the genetic circuit could mean many different things. Even you have one function, that could be just one enzyme. Even you can call that is a, a circuit, but that circuit is basically, if you have the inducer, inducer is input, and the output is the enzyme function. So that is basically mm -hmm. very simple circuit, right. but we don't call it circuit, but you could say that is also a circuit. So generic circuit, we typically saying, you know, logic gate, et cetera, but this is already complex, but you know, any function we add, that could be also, uh, we can say also circuit. Yeah. I have another question um, from Jonathan Suganda. Uh, he has question to clarify, is the reduced metabolic burden from the T-PRO system due to the antidepressor, which bypass the Charles NOT gate, which requires depressors in tandem, requiring more promoter 
and the transcription factor. Yes, I think that's one of the primary uh, reasons for the compression of these circuits. Yeah, so using the anti-oppressors uh, replaces the need to invert a gate using uh, essentially, uh, uh, yeah, essentially using the not gate uh, of a single of a single transcription factor, but also our ability to use uh, multiple transcription factors to regulate a single promoter uh, also allows us to reduce uh, that is the, the design space. So cello always has to use these tandem promoters to make their NOR gates, but we can essentially use uh, one promoter and two transcription factors. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, let me check whether we have more question. I guess we answer all the question from audience. Okay, so we may close. Uh, in that way, I can also go to the dinner. <laughs> later than uh, sooner than later okay so thank you all for joining and staying today we'll meet again on september already oh my god almost it's already september september 5 thursday the same time the same zoom link we'll have kev the silva at idea Te idea test plus also the CEO and co-founder of the Serendipity Collective and Professor Manish Kushiwaha at Michaelis Institute, University of Paris, Sacre. As usual, the follow-up informal chat will occur without recording. Please stay here. If you are interested in chatting with us, uh, I'll promote you to panelists who can speak and show your handsome and pretty faces if you wish. Uh, thank you. And I'm stop recording. One second.